10 Tools, Chapter 10, Astrology 3, A Vision of the Worldview of Astrology. Prolegomena. This is the third chapter in which I attempt to introduce to the reader why and how astrology has been, for me, an extraordinary tool for transformation. I'm not going to go into details presenting how this or that life situation was illuminated by the use of astrology. That belongs in a later volume. Everything I present here is prologue. To paraphrase Kant, the title to his short work, A Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, these three chapters on astrology function for me as a prolegomena to any future astrology. Think about an alien being who had never before encountered water, but who'd heard all sorts of things about water, most of them from aliens who had never encountered it either. So when he finally was confronted with water, he had a bunch of assumptions about it which needed to be corrected. What water is as a phenomenon, how it tastes, how his body feels in it, how water pours, congeals, distills, etc. All this might both serve to correct the false and misleading ideas about water he had picked up earlier and as preface to his actually learning how to swim. So here in these chapters... I attempt to give the reader a sense of the type of thing that astrology is and why I find it to be of ex such extraordinary value before I invite you to actually learn how to swim in its language. Elucidating the value of astrology is not an easy task given the bias of 20th century Western culture and given the, at worst, superstitious and at best superficial understanding of astrology that pervades all but the most serious of its practitioners. This final chapter on this most transformational tool is the most difficult for me to articulate. What I wish to do is to spell out my vision of the worldview of astrology. I debated whether or not to attempt it in this volume since it is abstract. Some might think it doesn't fit with the rest of the material presented. On the other hand, much of what I talk about in this book is to some extent abstract not to mention downright confusing to anyone who expects a merely logical presentation. Throughout the book, I spiral through many subjects, over and over, showing them in different lights, linking them in various ways. In this manner, I hope to implant in the reader a feel for the way a person who has absorbed the language of astrology actually thinks, how this way of thinking involves continuous change and therefore continuous exploration. It truly blows our minds to have our minds bent into circles and spirals. We are so used to straight lines. We feel so secure with straight lines. And yet, what have we but at the end of the line but death? No wonder we avoid death, since we do see it as the end. Despite my penchant for investigating assumptions, as I said earlier, I do not pretend to know or understand the deeper assumptions of astrology. Simply, the subject is too vast, and its origins lie too far back for me to ever pretend to uncover them. This, for me, as a Sagittarian, is a relief. It means I can stay in one place for a while, can explore and explore and never penetrate its further reaches. Since I was born with my son, Mars, and the Ascendant in the sign of Sagittarius, if ever I did begin to understand the assumptions of astrology, they would dissolve and I would move on. Sagittarius is the long-range traveler, searching for the meaning of life. Indeed, for Sagittarius, the search for the meaning of life is the meaning of life. Wherever I've already been, I want to go further. No matter how much I learn, my understanding of things rests in the void. Understanding is finite and floats within an infinite sea of mystery. I don't understand the sea of mystery from which astrology emerges, nor do I understand how or why I was led early on from one thing to another, always searching for a way to more fully comprehend the phenomenon of my own life. Looking back now, I discover early seeds of my fascination with astrology and see how these seeds germinated into vision. Teilhard Desjardins and Jean-Jean Piaget.
While still a senior in college and pregnant with my first child, I was riveted by the theory of evolution, not as formulated by Darwin, wherein mutations are random, but by Teilhard de Jardin, for whom evolution is purposeful and meaningful, tending towards an omega point which he called the new sphere, the one mind of collective consciousness. Many years prior to discovering astrology, this mystical interpretation of evolution had already altered my thinking, filling my imagination with visions of an ever-expanding universe, wherein consciousness is continuously catching up with creation. Another whose vision has influenced my own is Jean Piaget, a psychologist whose developmental epistemology pioneered the study of the way children's minds develop through time. Piaget understood the changes which children's perceptions undergo as occurring within a dynamic, ordered process. The child, he said, goes through a process wherein he or she is sometimes at one with the world and at other times seemingly under great stress. This alteration is accounted for by the formation and subsequent breakdown of what Piaget termed stages of equilibration, each of which becomes more and more differentiated and complex. The final stage, he says, forms when the child reaches the age of 12, when he or she becomes capable of thinking logically, like an adult. According to Jean Piaget, by the time a child is 12 years old, she or he has learned to represent, represent, represent the world outside within his mind. Ideas now substitute for objects which are combined and recombined according to the rules of formal logic. Piaget's theory was both descriptive and prescriptive. He assumed that not only was this the way adults do think, this is the way they should think. Logic, one might say, is the final word. This is not surprising. Piaget is a product of the same culture he was attempting to describe. When, years after absorbing Piaget, I began to study astrology, I discovered that Piaget's final stage is equivalent to the 12-year Jupiter cycle in astrology. Jupiter, the ruler of philosophical Sagittarius, is known as the greater benefic. Its energy is expansive. It makes us feel good by connecting us to a greater whole. The first whole to which we connect is the culture into which we were born. Since the meaning of the planet is its cycle, we can say that the completion of the first 12-year Jupiter cycle signifies that the 12-year-old child has incorporated the values and perspectives of the culture of which he or she happens to be a member. Thus, to look at Piaget's theory astrologically is to relativize it. Piaget's logic is not necessarily the adult point of view. It is rather the adult point of view of Western culture. If one thinks of human learning as developing through certain stages and compares Piaget's developmental stages with astrology's planetary cycles, then what immediately stands out is the fact that there are planetary cycles beyond Jupiter, at least one of which can be fully incorporated and thus considered a developmental stage, namely Saturn, with its cycle of approximately 29.5 years. And what is even more interesting, there are at least three more planetary cycles which last longer, indeed longer than our lifetimes, namely Uranus, 84 years, Neptune, 165 years, and Pluto, 248 years. With the possible exception of Uranus, these cycles can never be known to us because we do not live long enough to experience their full cycles. This means that when these planets activate natal planets within our birth charts, their action is beyond rational control, being essentially unpredictable, Uranus, mysterious, Neptune, and destructive, regenerative, Pluto. Within the domains of the three outer planets, the much-vaunted logic of the so-called adult Western mind has no application. Given my earlier absorption of the ideas of Deschartins and Piaget, once I had been struck by my third epiphany, that the meaning of a given planetary energy is its cycle, a new worldview arose within my imagination. This worldview uses the symbol system of astrology to extend Piaget's developmental theory of incorporating meaningful structures, and it presents a chronological structure for Desjardins' interpretation of evolution. 
Why vision? I have been describing pre precursors to this vision of a new world view based on astrology because I wish to lead the reader up to the vision the way I was led up to it, step by step, so that when I finally describe it, it will seem not only easy to grasp, but obvious. On the other hand, the reader may well be asking, why do I wish to describe this vision? Why does it matter so much to me? What would be lost without it? Again, my answer has to be that I am Sagittarian, the philosopher of the zodiac. For me, what counts is the overall perspective within which I see everything. Unless I do have an overall operating perspective, then nothing that I do or think or feel makes any sense. Unlike many people, I cannot live in a world without asking questions, questions about meaning. And since giving meaning to something seems to be equated with perceiving it as a whole, I ask about the whole, its meaning, or structure, or gestalt. And in that whole, the parts settle into their rightful places. This discussion may seem too abstract for some readers who are used to looking at the world piecemeal and asking questions about what lies within the world rather than question about the world as a whole. Perhaps it would help to make the place and importance of philosophy in life more concrete. Imagine yourself on your deathbed, needing to complete what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross calls your unfinished business before you die. We all know about this business. Perhaps your father or mother died before you could forgive him or her for whatever he or she did to you which left you crippled emotionally. Or perhaps your lover died before you could show how much you loved her or him. You know how this hurts, how awful, how incomplete you feel when you know it is too late for, for what? What does it mean to say we have unfinished business? And what is this need of ours to finish something? Well, think of any good story. What we call a story is not just a series of random or even chronological events strung together. In order to be emotionally and or intellectually satisfying, a story has to have what can be perceived as a beginning, a middle, and an end. The end of the story, if successful, renders the whole story meaningful. We understand the beginning and the middle parts of the story in a new way as a result of how it ended. Once it ends, we get the point of the story and can work to understand it as a whole. At the end of this life, we are at the end of our own particular story. It is not unusual for one who is dying to want to complete the story by coming to peace with her or his unfinished business. One might say that on our deathbeds, we naturally become philosophers, wanting to see our world as a whole. Now think of a worldview, or a paradigm, as we, call, as we call it these days, as a huge abstract collective story, allowing for the possibility of many various and individual stories within it. Each particular story, without our knowing it, since the assumptions of a worldview function unconsciously, conforms to the hidden rules of the larger, more abstract story. In our culture, for example, with its linear view of time, we don't like to think about death because we view death as the end of the line. When we are forced to think about death, we tell stories about it. For example, about the time we almost died and, quote, our whole life ran in front of us in the space of a few seconds, just like a movie, end quote. For those few seconds during which we presumed we were near death, the entire cycle of our life was recapitulated. Why? Why does our unconscious give us this movie? As the person on his or her deathbed consciously enters into a philosophical mode of thinking, so does our unconscious, when faced with a sudden, unexpected near-death experience, insists that we enter that philosophical mode quickly and intensely by heaving our whole life story up for review. I notice the same thing sometimes happens with astrological cycles. The meaningfulness of, for example, a two-year cycle, the Mars cycle, will be recapitulated at the end of that cycle in, say, a 24-hour period. When this happens to me, I'm instantly alerted. I think, ah, there's something about this 24-hour period the day is charged somehow with meaning. What? 
Then if I look up the astrology of that day, I might find, aha, the meaning of this day mirrors the meaning of the larger two-year cycle, which is now completing. So there seems to be something in the very nature of the human psyche or of consciousness itself, which yearns for meaning and which gains that meaning at the end of cycles, often through a shortened cycle of recapitulation, whatever the original cycle's size. From one short day to one long life, what we perceive as meaningful is gathered from cyclic holes. Now, instead of a cycle, think of a circle, which one might liken to a dynamic which is already unfolded in time. Rather than a time period, the dynamic cycle, we now have a space period, the structural circle, and a worldview can be likened to that space. It is of a certain size, and it allows certain possibilities, certain stories, and not others to be told within it. We can live our lives in certain ways and not others within the space of any particular worldview. When I spent that year investigating my assumptions, deconstructing my, our, worldview, I was left with nothing, no way to make sense of my experience. My paradigm for making sense had been destroyed. What was next? As a human being, I needed to have an overall structure through which to see the world. Like a set of glasses, a worldview functions as a lens with a certain refraction. Change the refraction and the world appears as a different place. The philosophical sign of Sagittarius is one of 12 signs of the circular zodiac signifying a certain phase of action and comprehension in the world. All 12 phases are equally important, and all of them are necessary to complete the whole. In 20th century Western culture of materialism, however, the way Sagittarius usually manifests is through mainline religious doctrines and other fundamentalist beliefs. There is seldom the play of ideas, the open-ended questions about value and meaning, which the evolved Sagittarian hungers for. Since I happen to be Sagittarius at a certain level in my own development, I naturally began to question the overall philosophical structure within which I was operating and found that it was too limiting for my evolving taste. That worldview felt like a static, two-dimensional grid, whereas what I was seeking was expansive, multidimensional. Please bear with me now while I finally, after this rambling preamble, attempt to flesh in with words what I live inside of every day, but which most people have never imagined. We don't imagine it partly because it is so abstract, but mostly we don't imagine it because our minds have not been trained to work that way. Looking back now, I realize that by investigating my own assumptions, I deconstructed the worldview into which I was enculturated and thereby open to the possibility of receiving a vision of this alternative worldview. Please think about what follows as one possible conceptual structure for understanding human evolutionary possibilities. And in thinking about this structure, please remember to ask not, is it true, since truth cannot be justified or proved? As the philosopher Sir Karl Popper said about scientific theories, ask instead, is it rich? Is it creative? Does it lead to further questions? Can it help us to live more fully and harmoniously? And if so, how? A vision of the worldview of astrology. Imagine that the old mystic axiom describes reality as above, so below, as within, so without. Imagine that any earthbound human can learn to experientially attune to the cycles of the planets of the solar system. Imagine that these planets, in appearing to surround Earth, function as a set of both collectively archetypal and specifically individual timers, pulsing out moments of quickening, both in our individual lives and in the life of humanity. Imagine that the universe is continuously expanding so that its center is everywhere and its circumference nowhere. If this is so, then each and every entity that can be said to be born at a certain time and place stands in the exact center of the universe. Imagine 
each individual standing in the center of the universe, surrounded by a series of concentric rings representing the orbits of the planets of our solar system. At the time of this individual's birth, each planet was in a certain degree in its nearly circular path around the sun as seen from Earth. Together, these planets created a geometrical structure which is unique for the individual born at that moment. This circular map in space also functions as a cyclical calendar in time of the unique rhythmic unfolding of the laws of that individual's life as a process. Imagine that each individual's life process configures into multiple and interpenetrating time-space meanings which are generated by the pulsing of planetary cycles of various lengths through their circuits and back again going round and round. These various cycles are constantly creating ever new geometrical patterns, each of which is a further development of what has gone before and refers back in time to the birth pattern as the constant which, throughout life, is continuously unfolding. Imagine that each individual chooses his or her moment of birth, the birth pattern which will be most attuned to the developmental needs of the soul in this incarnation. Imagine that each individual continuously chooses whether or not to act in accordance with the divine plan of his nature as chosen by the soul and as signified by the geometrical pattern in the birth chart. Imagine, were each individual to consciously act in harmony with her or his own soul's growth, that the planetary music of the spheres would be duplicated here on Earth. Each of us, acting in accordance with the divine plan of our own unique soul, moving in harmony with all the others. The implications of this new, very old worldview are revolutionary. They include the following. Since every entity born is both central to the universe and utterly singular and individual, then everyone born is both equal and special. The rule always holds. Only one entity can be born at a particular time and place. Even twins born through cesarean section occupy different spaces within, with their bodies, as are usually lifted from the womb at least a few seconds apart. Since the planets are always in motion, both their positions and relationships to each other are always changing, as ordered by the laws of geometry and planetary motion. There is no, secure, no security or certainty or stability, no bottom line outside the self. For each of us, the self stands at the center of the universe, expressing through its original pattern, which unfolds naturally according to its own internal laws. Creation is continuous, ever flowing through the still point at the center of the self. Indeed, each expanding human is a species unto him or herself. Since each human being is so individual, there is no one upon whom anyone can model the growth of his or herself. Only by looking within and creating a relationship with that inner world can we discover who we are, where we are going, what we are here for. We can no longer compare ourselves to others. All we can do is live up to the potential lying within ourselves to which we alone have the key. Since the individual stands at the center of the universe surrounded by a series of concentric rings which represent the orbits of the planets from the 29-day cycle of the moon out to the 248-year cycle of Pluto, and since each planet's space-time sphere is a dimension of awareness which is incorporated through the process of experiencing its full cycle, then growth beyond physical maturity is defined in terms of expanding awareness. The cycles of the long-cycled planets from Saturn, 30 years, on out to Pluto, 248 years, represent these larger dimensions of awareness. Continuous growth and awareness is both natural and inevitable for those who are truly learning from their own experience. If the cycle of any planet is its meaning, and if we cannot understand a cycle until we've completed it for the first time, then there are certain planetary cycles which operate in our lives in an entirely different manner than others. These outer planets are Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, and their cycles are respectively 84, 165, and 248 years. The processes of evolution and transformation in both individual and collective life are symbolized by the cycles of the outer planets. 
Some of us, of course, do complete the cycle of Uranus, but not until very late in our lives. Conceivably, if advances in understanding the process of aging lead to a longer lifespan, then some people who complete the Uranus cycle will have time to consciously put into practice what this cycle represents. Since we cannot complete the cycles of the outer planets, we do not understand what they mean, what experiential holes they present. Our experience of them is always fragmentary, partial. We can never learn to totally control and focus these energies, use them for our own purposes. We can only surrender to them, either consciously or unconsciously. These outer planets, with natures greater than we are, are the sources of genius and madness, of whatever magic, miracles, and mystery we accept into our lives. Whereas the above implications of the worldview of astrology focus on individuality and diversity, astrology also accounts for community or unity. This happens at every level. For example, two people born on the same day do share certain characteristics, since most of the planets, all but the moon, do not move faster than one degree a day. People born the same year share, share characteristics of planets with longer cycles, from Jupiter and Saturn on out. And generational astrology has to do with periods during which outer planets are in certain signs. For example, the Pluto and Leo generation includes all those born between the years 1938 and 1958. The Uranus and Gemini <coughs> generation includes all those born between 1942 and 1949, etc., Sign placements of outer planets describe the unconscious urges and attitudes of generations. And the transits of outer planets through the signs describe epochs in the political and cultural life of humanity. The most profound unifying idea is the central axiom of astrology, as above, so below. This mystic axiom connects our lives on Earth with a greater whole, the solar system of this small sun, which is itself connected to a greater whole, since it is also a star within the Milky Way galaxy, and so on out into infinity. Astrology honors the central question of a philosophy, namely how to simultaneously account for both unity and diversity, the one and the many. The many consists of equal and diverse ones, each signified by the planetary pattern created during its place and date and time of birth. Each small one is a unique being into itself with its own set of laws, and all ones are evolving according to the greater law of one, the interpenetrating field of the ever-cycling planetary energies in the solar system, and its cycling beyond into the galaxy, and so on into infinity. In this astrological worldview, there is uniqueness, since we are all born in our own unique time and space, but not separation since we are all living within the same field of interpenetrating energies. Nor is there judgment, since everyone is unique and no one can be compared with anyone else. This concludes what I can articulate of this vision of the new worldview which astrology makes possible. I realize that this vision is difficult to grasp, that it tends to make one feel as if one is floating, swirling, ungrounded. This is not surprising since it describes a universe in constant motion, constant change with no bottom line. We are used to bottom lines in economics, in epistemology, everywhere. Like our linear view of time, our assumption of the bottom line falls under the rubric of the straight line, with the bottom line being either the lowest rung of a ladder of straight lines or the lower end point of a single line. This rubric operates wherever the structure of things is conceived as a hierarchy. One might say that the hierarchy, the bottom line, clock time, all these belong to the particular space of our worldview, the greater story of our culture. Through astrology, we surrender to a different kind of worldview or greater story, a story in which the universe is in constant motion and the center of the universe is everywhere, its circumference nowhere. In order to surrender to this new worldview, we must center ourselves. We no longer need a bottom line, nor do we need justification or proof. For our security, our safety lies in the center of the self. In the center of the self stands the still point of the turning world. Grounding the vision in experience. This vision of the circular, cyclical way the world works has ramifications beyond astrology. For example, it gives me a methodology for pushing myself through my own tendency to polarize with others and thus to create conflicts with them. 
I discovered this some years ago when I wrote an essay on an astrological topic, first presenting my own view and then comparing and contrasting it with the view of another. I didn't consciously realizing that by doing this, I set up a polarity with him. It felt so natural to do it this way, so real, so definite and clear. No wonder it felt natural. It was how I had been trained. In that essay, it was as if I was standing on one point in my position and looking across to another point, finger cocked like a child using her hand to mimic a pointing gun. Luckily, with my dear friend Claudia's help, I threw the essay away. I caught myself in time to not make enemies, to not get trapped once again in that polarized place, that limited space where I distract myself pre from presenting what I see. Instead of allowing my imagination to proceed further, I had been getting caught up in defending my position in the face of real or imagined attack. Here is my take on the underlying motivations behind our culture's psychological, sociological mechanism for making enemies. When I begin to describe the further reaches of what I see, at some point I grow afraid. What I fear is infinity, endlessness, continuously opening space. Review that classic nightmare, falling through space. In response to fear, my mind contracts to a level at which it feels secure. First, I posit a point in space where I take my stand. From here, I look out and create, project, another point at a certain near or far distance from the one upon which I am standing. And I then say, this is not that. This point is not that point. I define myself through what I am not. I am not like him. He becomes my opposite. We are polarized and competitive. There is only room for one at the top of the ladder, the hierarchy. We are in a battle for survival, the survival of the fittest, and only one of us wins. This time, immediately prior to the whole sorry cycle of conflict beginning again, I caught myself preparing to do it and recognized where it would inevitably lead. I create my own reality. In order to change that reality, I must first change my mind by enlarging my vision. I do this by considering the epistemological mechanism of projection and its hostile repercussions in behavior from the point of view of geometry. Thinking visually, I can view my opponent as merely the other end point of a line, which I've just created through positing a point across from my own. This line, in turn, can be visualized as the diameter of a circle the size of which is determined by the length of the line, by how near or far away I originally posited my opponent to be. Now I have created a circle around myself, whereas formerly there was open space. I have created a circle and I am caught inside without realizing it. Whereas before I was afraid of openness, now I'm afraid of its opposite, claustrophobia. I seek a way out, want to break out, to punch my way through by destroying the point opposite to the one upon which I think I am standing. In reality, I'm no longer standing upon this point, which is now a point upon the circumference of the circle. Somehow, I've jumped to a point exactly halfway to the other side. I'm standing in the middle of the circle now. I must be, otherwise I wouldn't feel so enclosed, so surrounded on all sides by potential enemies. So in order to first visualize and then resolve this self-created conflict, I first visualize the initial polarity geometrically as a line which in turn becomes the diameter of a circle. The third step is to consciously realize that I have placed myself squarely in the center of that line, that circle. As long as I stand in the center of the circle without awareness of being there, I feel surrounded, enclosed, claustrophobic, even paranoid. Once I recognize that I am standing precisely there, and that this circle is one which I created through the psychological mechanism of projection, my experience of the circle changes utterly. Now I feel myself in the center, equidistant from all points on the circumference of this particular circle I have created to orient myself. As my goal in childhood was intellectual certainty and emotional security, the bottom line, so now the goal of both head and heart is that of centering. As I ground myself in the precise center of the circle I have created, I find I am standing upon the very ground I was seeking all along. Standing in the center, 
I sense the circumference of the circle I've created as a membrane rather than a wall. It breathes, it moves, vibrating in resonance to the beat of my heart. Rather than being something I must break through to once again express my freedom, I can now rest within the circle as one more form through which I both orient myself and direct energy. For I sense my capacity to create an infinite number of concentric circles, both larger and smaller than this one. The circles radiate in all directions. The circles are frameworks or structures, paradigms within which I make sense of perception. Each of these circles can be visualized as a globe or sphere or dimension of awareness. Each one contains an infinity of points, both upon its outer and inner skins and within the space which it encloses. Even in a limited space, there are no limits. Between any two points, there is always a third. In order to bypass which my means old habit that between of any two points, there is a space, by tying it down which to itself work looms into one end point of a polarized point of view and then creating conflict, I recognize myself as the center of a continuously expanding universe. Each of us, as unique as singular individuals, stands centered, radiating outwards from the center of a universe which has no outer limits, no circumference. Each of us as the eye of our own storm, the still point of our own turning world. We are creative agents, attuning ourselves to and expressing ourselves through larger and larger spheres of awareness forever. We are all creators. We all breathe the same air. Our hearts beat to a universal biological rhythm, a rhythm entrained with other more subtle rhythms, all of them in concert as the universal harmony, the music of the spheres, the song of ourselves. We are one, we are many, we are the one in the many. All polarities dissolve in the swelling sea of infinite space.